switch the camera shot. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the 2023 Take Wing Award Lecture. Before we get started, we have an exciting presentation and I'd like to introduce Dr. Bridget Jones, our Assistant Academic Dean in the Office of Student Affairs, Pediatric Allergist, Immunologist, and the most recent awardee of an endowed chair uh, at the UMKC School of Medicine and Children's Mercy Hospital. Dr. Jones. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am really happy to be here to um, introduce Lieutenant Colonel um, Catherine Ogeen from the United States Public Health Service today. She's here today to give a special award, um, the U.S. Public Health Service Excellence in Public Health Award to Jada Ohini Ajay. So before I get started, I just want to um, provide a few words and talk about the excellent work that Jada's done that's, that's led to um, this award. Um, so Jada is an active member of the Student National Medical Association, whose mission includes addressing the needs of underserved communities. During her first year of medical school, Ms. Ohini served as the local chapter community service chair where she led involvement of the chapter in the local community gardens and to improve quality food access and availability to underserved communities. She led the chapter volunteer work with various organizations, about 10 or 15 here that I count. Her leadership skills and passions led to her taking on significant leadership roles within the local SNMA chapter, becoming president-elect in 2020 and president in 2021. She's also an active leader of the medical student section of the American Medical Association. She served in various roles at local and national levels within AMA, including serving as UMKC AMA chapter president, region two delegate, region two chair, Minority Issues Committee Vice Chair and Medical Student Section at Large Officer and Governing Council and Governing Council. A uh, highlight of some of the work that Jada did with AMA was a presentation that she gave uh, called Anti-Racism and Allyship for the 2020 AMA Regional 2's Annual Physicians of the Future Summit. She overall is deeply involved in fostering the next generation of students from underrepresented backgrounds in medicine and science. She recently served as the executive director of the Critical Mass Gathering, an annual event held here in Kansas City um, and held by the KC Mission Vision Project, whose goal is to increase the number of racially and eth ethnically underrepresented students educated in health sciences and retained here in the Kansas City metro area. During um, Jada's third year in our medical program, she was in the unique position serving as president of both SNMA and AMA local chapters. Um, there she was able to harness the advocacy of both local organizations to found and lead the development of the first interprofessional UMKC student-led community health fair, the KC Community Health and Wellness Fair. She describes that she knew it was a large undertaking, but I was not alone in the realization that public health was in a dismal state in Kansas, in Kansas City, especially as the pandemic took hold. In Jackson County, 16% of the population was living in poverty, many of which were families of marginalized racial and ethnic backgrounds who had limited access to health care and resources. So she organized and led students, faculty, and staff across multiple health professional schools and areas over a 10-month period to raise funding, develop partnerships across affiliate hospitals, develop infrastructure and logistics, and provide training to support a large community health fair event. On January 25th, 2020, on June 25th, 2022, the first KC Community Health and Wellness Fair served over 100 Kansas City adults and children, where they provided about 45 sports physicals and multiple other health-related resources. And this event will be continued again this year. 
Um, Jada describes her view as a medical student and how she perceives the opportunities that she has to interact with patients from a public health lens as every patient has a story and every story invites the opportunity to make one's neighborhood a safer and healthier place. So with that, I welcome Lieutenant Commander and Jada up to the podium. All right, good afternoon, UMKC. I am Lieutenant Commander Catherine Ogeen. I currently serve as a United States Public Health Nurse uh, for the United States Public Health. I, we serve on the front lines in the nation's fight against disease and poor health. The United States Public Health Service was founded in 1798 to provide medical care to sailors and merchant seamen with yellow fever and malaria. Over the subsequent 225 years, our mission has broadened to deliver health promotion and disease prevention programs to all people here and abroad. I am here today on behalf of the Public Health Service Physician Professional Advisory Committee to recognize an outstanding medical student who has been selected to receive the 2023 Excellence in Public Health Award. This award was established to recognize medical students' contributions and commitment to public health in recognition for their demonstrated dedication to public health. It is my pleasure to now present the 2023 United States Public Health Service Excellence in Public Award to Jada Oni Ajay. Jada, your leadership and hard work truly demonstrates your passion and dedication to meeting the public health needs of others within the medical profession. Your accomplishments clearly support health promotion and disease prevention here in KC the cornerstones of Healthy People 2030 and the Surgeon General's priority. We encourage you to continue your passion and dedication in the public health, to be a leader in this profession, and most importantly, to lead with integrity, service, and excellence. Once again, congratulations on your noteworthy achievement. We thank you, for your, we thank you and your community thanks you for all your hard work and dedication to public health. We also hope you consider a career in the United States Public Health Service upon your graduation. Congratulations, Jada. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce the E. Great Diamond MD Take Wing Awardee. The Take Wing Award is the School of Medicine's highest honor given annually to a graduate who has demonstrated excellence in the practice of academic medicine. The award was initiated in 1988, and Dr. Rick Barron is the 35th awardee in our school's over 50 year history. He is a 1980 graduate of our school and served in the Air Force, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He trained in neurology at Wolford Hall Medical Center and completed neuromuscular medicine fellowship at Ohio State. His early career years were spent in Texas, and as a faculty member at UT Southwestern in 1993, he was a distinguished chair in neurological mobility research. He is nationally known a physician, scientist, and continues his research into ALS, muscular dystrophy, and myasthenia gravis, doing so for more than two decades. He took on his newest challenge, and I'd say your newest and your greatest challenge, perhaps, <laughs> in, 19, in 2020, when he became the Executive Vice Chancellor of Health Affairs at MU, and in 2022, was appointed the Dean at the U, at MU School of Medicine. So it's really an honor because Rick and I have known each other through the years. He was at KU. You were there for more than two decades, I think. And we first got to know each other there. So I recognized him clearly as a physician scientist and a great collaborator. But it's been my honor to serve as a dean at the same time you serve as a dean at MU as we've collaborated together with goals to not only elevate what happens with our medical students, but what happens within the educational programs and what happens in our research platforms. So 
It is my pleasure now if Dean Barron will come to the podium to present you with the 2023 E Grade Diamond Take Wing Award. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean Jackson, uh, and thank you to the Take Wing Committee for giving me the honor to be this year's awardee, and it's particularly special that it's been given by Dean Jackson, uh, another UMKC alum, and, you know, she and I are the two University of Missouri Medical School deans. I mean, that's a pretty big deal um, for UMKC, and so uh, it means a lot. Uh, and uh, to say that it means a lot is sort of an understatement. Uh, to the UMKC School of Medicine and the broader UMKC institution has been an enormous port, part of my life story. Uh, and I began in the, as an adolescent in the suburbs of St. Louis, and UMKC really brought me into adulthood uh, where I became a physician in this wonderful environment on the Volcker campus, on this campus, and in Kansas City. And I, I clearly remember my father, and I'm sure this is true of many of the six-year students, my father driving me to Kansas City in the cold of winter um, and interviewing in the old nursing building, which I hear still exists, um, and uh, never really thinking what was going to happen with the rest of my career. Um, I never thought I was going to be a physician, at least as a teenager I didn't. Um, I had read Irving Stone's Passions of the Mind about Sigmund Freud when I was 16, and that got me interested in the brain, but I thought I was going to be a psychologist. Um, and then I found out about the six-year med school, and I sent in an application. Um, that's how these things happen. So as I will say in my comments at commencement tonight, and Dean Jackson, thank you for inviting me to the commencement cer ceremony tonight. I really do believe that being accepted into UMKC School of Medicine uh, is like winning the lottery. And I believe I won the lottery very early in life. And then it was up to me to come through and try to take advantage of that opportunity. And I hope that being conferred the Take Wing Award, that that recognition is in part um, saying that perhaps I've succeeded in realizing that goal. Uh, and took advantage of the opportunities that were given to me. And I, that perhaps I've used my lottery ticket to become a successful physician, and in my case, a, a successful academic leader, teacher, and researcher, and more recent, recently, an academic administrator. So I thought for my Take Wing lectureship uh, today, I would look back over my career and try to provide you all with some of the lessons that I've learned along the way and that I can share with you, especially some of the young students that are in here. And I just had great lunch with Sam and Anand, and uh, that, that was really wonderful. And I heard they want to be neurologists, which really got me interested. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about advice that I wish I would have gotten in medical school uh, or as a resident or as a fellow and that I hope it'll be useful. I gave this advice to Sam and Anand at lunch, and they, they, they said, why didn't someone tell us this before? So we're going to go through some of that. Uh, so I put on a nice blue suit for this presentation, have my kangaroo uh, lapel pin on, and then uh, my, my, my team put together gold and black slides. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so it's both. It's all University of Missouri, right? And what I'll do in this talk is talk briefly about my career pathway to academics, uh, discuss what I think is the, uh, what the career options are for physicians when they finish their training, the part that they don't tell you about in medical school. Uh, and then in my case, uh, lessons I've learned discuss pathways to research if you're gonna do research career at a university setting, um, that what the stages are, uh, and then what the essential uh, barriers, uh, what the barriers and the, and the essential components are. And then maybe at the end, if there is time, talk about why. You know, why do we do these things? So, uh, <laughs> Paul Cuddy just took me on a great trip down memory lane, and I went upstairs where all the class pictures are, and this is my picture upstairs, uh, and um, where, 
hairstyles were a little more liberal, um, although it's back. I think it's coming back now, this look. Uh, uh, but I actually joined the Air Force uh, when I was a third year medical student and uh, had a great career in the Air Force. Here's me as a uh, no, first year neurology resident in San Antonio at Wolford Hall. And then this is me as a major. Uh, I ended up retiring as a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel. But, you know, I would say that I was the most unlikely academic prospect um, coming, from, coming from this background. But uh, how did I become an academic researcher? Well, as I, I was, uh, did get a little bit of exposure in the first couple years uh, at, at University of Missouri, Kansas City, working in a micro lab, uh, Working, uh, learning a lot of physiologic psychology from a, a great teacher, Dr. Sheridan. Uh, but then uh, uh, when I uh, was still in medical school, as part of my Air Force commitment, I had to go down to uh, San Antonio and spend a clerkship. It was sort of required. And so I picked neurosurgery, and I was with this young neurosurgeon who uh, was trained in, in, in Boston, Dave Kasdan. And we had a baby that he did a consult on that had a bump on its head, and as a neurosurgeon did the biopsy, and it came back something called cranial fasciitis. And um, he said, Rick, you need to write this up. So I remember going into his house, uh, sitting by the swimming pool, and he had out a typewriter, uh, and we <laughs> wrote this case up. And it was my first publication, second lieutenant, and, uh, and that's where it, that was one of the first things that started it. Then, in my neurology residency at Wilford Hall, they really had a great program with the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, where neurology residents from around the country would meet every year, and we would get the uh, opportunity to present research projects. And so I did that, and that, I liked that. That was fun. Um, but I still didn't know I was going to be an academic, and it's really when I did a fellowship at Ohio State, and I had amazing mentors, and I was exposed to a side of medicine that I just didn't know existed. Um, and, um, and, and so, I, as I was talking to the med students today, uh, you can make these decisions sort of later in your career, um, as I did. Um, so I did two more years in the Air Force on active duty. Then I went off active duty. I was in San Antonio at UT. Then I was at Southwestern at the other UT. Then I went to KU in 2001. And in some places, I was a little fish in a big pond, but at UT Southwestern, it was sort of the reverse, and I got to see a major uh, academic medical center in operation. Uh, uh, at, at KU, where I had 20 great years, I was able to build a neurology department. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues are here today. Thank you, friends, for coming. And, uh, and, uh, and then I started building other infrastructure resources for all physicians to do clinical and translational science. And Dr. Bhattacharya was there when I was doing that portion of my career. So it, 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 was, a, it was a journey, but it, I didn't start out that way. Um, this is one of, one of the luckiest things that happened to me. So I was a fellow at Ohio State seeing muscular dystrophy patients with Dr. Mendel, and a young boy comes in with delayed gastric emptying. These Duchenne dystrophy boys get this, and he died. It's very tragic. Um, but uh, we did an autopsy, and then Dr. Mendel said, we need to study this more. So this was my first prospective project where we did delayed gastric emptying studies on a cohort of Duchenne boys, showed it was delayed. But it just happened to be the year that the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy was discovered. And so we speculated that maybe the dystrophin was deficient in smooth muscle as well. And the New England Journal of Medicine bought that. You know, I thought, it would, my mentor said, I think we can get this in New England Journal. And so, uh, uh, sometime it's timing and luck. Uh, then here's a picture of myself and some of my key mentors. Um, Dr. Jerry Mendel is uh, in, in the middle, and uh, uh, he, uh, he actually told me to write that paper, told me to write a lot of papers. Uh, and, uh, and he actually was one of the discoverers that just sort of essentially cured spinal muscular atrophy with gene therapy at Ohio State. It's a pretty amazing discovery. Uh, and that's me a few years ago, Dr. Griggs in Rochester, and Dr. Kissel on the far left uh, at Ohio State. They were all just amazing mentors. And Dr. Mendel got me as his right-hand man to do my first multi-center 
investigator-initiated trial of IVIG in chronic Guillain-Barre, which worked. This is before industry got involved in it. Uh, and that's what got me launched on thinking, I can do these big multi-center trials. So I launched off and I did my first big multi-center trial, which was IVIG in myasthenia, and it was a lemon. Um, because the, there was a drug shortage in the 90s of ni IVIG, and so we had to abort the study after we enrolled 15 patients. Laura, you remember this well, Laura Herbalin. And, um, but we made uh, lemonade out of lemons. You, of course, you always write up your negative data. Um, and we also, at the time we did this trial in the 90s, we developed scales to measure myasthenia gravis. And one is the MGADL scale, and the other is this quantitative myasthenia gravis score. These scales are now standard in all myasthenia gravis clinical trials uh, around the world, and they're actually used in clinic if a neurologist sees an MG scale. So um, developing scales early on can be very, um, can be very important. And then uh, over the years, I've had the fortune of being part of big teams, that, and we've done four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five uh, federally funded multi-center trials uh, that we initiated. Um, some were 20 sites, some were up to 40 sites, and uh, I just finished one in ALS right when I was uh, arriving to, Colum uh, uh, to Columbia, Missouri. And, and those were more standard random, randomized control trials, but then I started getting into PCORI trials. And last night at dinner with Gary Salzman, he said he's involved in a PCORI trial here. So PCORI trials are different, uh, and that is where you don't have a placebo, you just randomize patients to different treatment arms that are standards of care, and you see which one is better. And so in this one, we randomized patients with painful neuropathy of the feet and try to determine what's better, amitriptyline, duloxetine, pregabalin, or mixilatine. And you come up with an answer. Um, there's no such thing as a negative trial, actually, um, which is nice. And so I, I'm, my, uh, we're still trying to get more of these PCORI grants, and it's a great new avenue for research funding. So that's sort of a little brief story about how I got where I'm at today. I'm leaving out all the administration part, because that's sort of boring. Um, so. Uh, uh, so this is what I just shared with Anand and Sam. This is what they don't teach you when you first uh, uh, sign up for medical school. So now you finish medical school, you finish your residency, you finish your fellowship. You don't have to do a fellowship, but let's say you do a fellowship. What the heck do you do next? Um, and this is sort of, I think, the decision points that you can make at, at that point. You can either decide to go in a non-academic practice setting, which is, I think, the majority of, of docs do that, and you can either be in a private setting, either by yourself or a small group, or you can work for a big health system, HCA, uh, St. Luke's, uh, 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 North Kansas City, um, uh, and, and, and in those environments, most of the time, you're primarily taking care of patients. Over time, you can do some other things, but it's a little more difficult. So let's say you decide to work at an academic medical center in an academic healthcare system. Um, what are the options there? Well, first, you can do basically 100% clinical or 95% clinical with a little uh, service work or some, other t or, or some minor education role. And basically, in that setting, you're pretty much the same as the doc that works in, in the, in the non-academic health system. And that's great. I love those docs. Those are the docs that make the hospital profitable. Um, the majority of our doctors uh, that we hire at academic health systems are on that track um, where, they're, where they're seeing patients. But if you do get the research bug, like I did somewhere along the way, uh, what are your options then? And that's where I have uh, clinical with uh, clinical with clinical translational research. Um, so then I think there's basically three pathways. One is you could be predominantly a clinician and spend maybe one day a week, so 20% of your time. Sometime you don't get that much, you get a little less, but where you are trying to build a research portfolio. And I call that the clinical scholar track. It's got different names at different places. Um, and you, if you're successful, like I was in this, and this is how I started, you can switch over time 
and do more and more research. And you basically buy yourself out of clinical time by getting successful in research grants. So the other pathway is where you are absolutely know that you are going to be a, a researcher the, for the majority of your career, and you want to get an NIH grant. And if you're going to go down that pathway, then you can either work in a wet lab or you can work in a dry lab, but you need to do a fellowship at a place where you're trained to be prepared to put in NIH grant applications from the day you graduate fellowship, or even before, in your last year of fellowship is the best time. And then you get hired by a department chair who says, you are 80% um, research. You're only going to do one day a week in clinic. If you're a surgeon, it's a little different. It's usually 50-50, um, uh, research uh, versus clinical. Um, and, but your focus is to get an NIH uh, career development award or a VA career development award or some, something like that. How many docs go down that path? Not many. Not many. Um, I... Uh, if, if we hire 100 physicians uh, at MU, maybe two or three will be down that, that pathway. But you need a few of them. You need a few of them because those are the docs that often are moving the needle and making some of the big discoveries. Not always, but that, that's, that's generally the case. And so, um, so, that, so this, 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 that's the simplified explanation of this uh, diagram. There are some other things you can do with a uh, uh, MD, you can do federal. I could have stayed in the military. Um, public health service. See, I, I, I have you on my slide. Yeah, uh, Lieutenant Commander is a nurse, but same same idea. Um, uh, VA. Um, one one of the med students asked me, "Well, what if you went uh, at lunch? What if you want to get a law degree?" I used to have that on here too, but I don't know why I took it off this. And you can. Uh, I have a lot of friends that have gotten law degrees, and they do things with that. So, so this is the stuff that you should hear about in medical school. All right, so I think I'm going to go over this part really quickly, but uh, if you are uh, uh, nearing the end of your fellowship training and you're thinking that you want to do research at an academic institution, what do you ask your chairman for? And this is the other stuff they don't teach you about. So if you are in that rarefied NIH pathway, um, then you actually get protected time. They, they, they have to come up with the resources so you don't have to be in clinic except for one day a week. Um, but if you're on the clinical scholar track, you know, you're lucky if you get a, a half day. You're really lucky if you get a whole day. Um, I've heard of some more generous situations, but that's usually what it is. And if you're just seeing patients, you shouldn't really be expecting any protected time. That's your job, to see patients. Uh, and it's sort of hard to do research in that environment. So uh, the next table is a little daunting. Uh, I actually published this uh, in, in a... <coughs> In, in a publication, uh, and the reference is here. But, um, and I actually, uh, if anyone wants this, I have all this summarized on one piece of paper. I have the career diagram and then this table. And it's what you should be doing at the different stages of your career and what grants you should be applying for, what activities you should be doing. I have it sort of broken up to, if you're a med student, um, uh, or a resident, or even a fellow, you're in your late 20s, early 30s, and these are the sort of things you should be doing. If you get your first academic job as an assistant professor, you know, you're going for these career development grants if you're on that NIH pathway. And then I'm all the way at the bottom here. So <laughs> I am definitely mid, no, I'm late 60s. Okay, I'm late 60s and, uh, and 70s. And so, um, you know, you can eventually become an executive vice chancellor for health affairs, you know, or, or, or retire, um, or, but I'm not ready for that yet. I am emeritus from KU, so I spent enough time at KU where I retired as a distinguished professor there, emeritus, so I still have my KU ties as well. So uh, anyone wants this table, I'll give it to them. You can look at it in a little more detail. Uh, it, I, I think a lot of people take away good stuff from it. All right, so now... Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things on what I think are careers to uh, academic success. And this is the first thing. So it has to start somewhere. And you'll see why I'm showing this. I'm going to show four great movie video clips. You can relax during these. So, so this is Shakespeare in Love with Shakespeare and Kit Marlowe in a bar and Shakespeare has writer's block. He can't come up with the next idea for his next play. Straight up, Will. 
Give my friend a beaker of your best brandy. Kit. How goes it, Will? Wonderful, wonderful. Burbage says you have a play. I have. And the chinks to show for it. I insist. A beaker for Mr. Marlowe. I hear you have a new play for the curtain. Not new. My Dr. Faustus. Oh, I love your early work. Is this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? I have a new one nearly finished and better. The Massacre at Paris. Good title. Mm. Yours? Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter. <sighs> yes, I know, I know. Fair what idea. is the story? Well, there's this pirate. In truth, I've not written a word. Romeo. Romeo is Italian. Always in and out of love. Yes, that's good. Until he meets Ethel. Do you think? The daughter of his enemy. The daughter of his enemy. His best friend is killed in a duel by Ethel's brother. Or something. His name is Mercutio. Mercutio. Good name. Will, they're waiting for you. Yes, I'm coming. Good luck with yours, kid. Anyway, I thought I your play was for it's Burbage. Cute fiction. This is a different one. A different one you haven't written? But this is where Shakespeare well, got the idea for Romeo and Juliet. So someone's got to come up with an idea to do research or to do art. Um, but, and it doesn't have to be you. It could be one of your colleagues, like it was in this case. So the, the, the two great themes from Shakespeare and love, I, one is love, but the other is discovery, which most people don't see that. So these are the, the 10 essentials that I think you need to have to be successful in academic work. So you have to have the idea. Shakespeare got that idea from Kit Marlowe. Probably the most important is you have to have whatever you call it, interest, desire, curiosity. You have to want to do it. Because if you don't really want to do it and, and have the determination to stick in there after multiple fail, failed attempts, you're not going to be successful. There has to be a little bit of talent, but not a lot. Um, you do have to get training. Training today is a lot better than when I went through uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Time, you need mentors, you need a team. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, you need a place to do it, you need money, and if you're gonna do clinical research, you need space. So I think those are the essentials. And then I took this clip out of Shakespeare in Love too. This is when they're getting ready, they're at the Globe Theater. Men return to the house! And that's it. So this is the team showing up. Who is this? Silence, you jock! I am Hieronimo. I am Tamberley. I am Faustus. I am Barabbas, the Jew of Malta. Oh, yes, Master Will. I am Henry the Sixth. What is the play, and what is my part? Uh, one moment, sir. Who are you? I'm, um, I'm the money. He's the grant. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to have the idea, you have to have the team, you have to have the grant money. So that's, he's the grant money. All right, so uh, I think, uh, anyway, this is a discussion I had with the medical students at lunch. You have a number of opportunities to get involved in research. Some are involved in high school, and I know Dean Jackson sees a lot of these uh, young high school students getting accepted in the program to do amazing research in high school. Or you can do it as, a, as an undergrad. Med school, you get a chance to do research. Summer research is good. Grad school, if you're a PhD. Then uh, residency. There's not a lot of time to do research in residency, but some, some hang in there and do some. Fellowship is the key. Uh, and then you get your first faculty position, so I think, so this is minor league spring training, and then, then you get your first job as an assistant professor, and you really uh, need to succeed there. So you have three, three strikes. Um, if, if you get three strikes, you're out. You're, if you haven't started it um, by, by the time you're junior faculty, it's, it's really difficult to get in the game. But, uh, so I, I like the Royals analogy. Dean Jackson and I were talking about the Royals quite a bit this morning. Um, and they, they, they have 
they have a way to go before they get back to their Grand Slam era. Um, so here's my avatar. Um, so, uh, but I didn't really get started till later. All right, so the other thing you need is a mentor. And it's really key. I showed you a picture of some of my mentors. And I really like this mentorship clip in one of our, all, all of our favorite movies. Oh, let me hover and click. Sandofloa. Sandofloa. Big sucker, Sandofloa. Sandofloa. Now show me wax on, wax off. The reluctant student. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Concentrate. Look in my eye. Like a hand. Thumb inside. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on. Wax off. Ush. Show me paint a fence. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Other side. Look, I. Always look, I. Show me paint a house. Side, side. Lock wrist. Side, side. Side, side. Ush. Show me wax on, wax off. Catch! 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 Show me paint a fence. Catch! 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 Show me side to side. Catch! 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 Show me sand of floor. Catch! Anyway, that's a little long. I always get chills in my spine whenever I see that. So what a great mentor. So you have to have at least one local mentor, and then you also have to have... Oh, skip that. And then you also have to have a number of long distance mentors, and those have always been essential for my career. The other thing my mentors always taught me, and I've taught all of my students over the years, is you need to write, write, write. From day one, um, simple case reports, uh, the scales and methods I've already mentioned, early results, negative results, pivotal papers, but you can't just write, wait for the big one. You have to write things up all along the way. You try first tier journals, second tier journals, third tier journals. Um, I had a, I used to have a file called Fringe Journals, um, <laughs> but and, and so you, you should be able to get, you should be able to publish almost everything that you work on. Um, book chapters early in your career, not so much later in your career. Um, books maybe you know uh, not as useful anymore, but I, uh, sometimes you get the opportunity to do books. Uh, the problem with publication now is open access, there are so many bad open access journals that are predatory. And um, so I no longer even have a fringe journal file, it's the bad open access journal file. And so you really have to work with your librarian. The librarians are the one that know this. They know which ones are legitimate and which ones are, are, are not. Um, there are some that are good, like my open access journal that I started, it's a good one. It's not predatory, it's completely free. I let, uh, I, uh, it goes through peer review. I, it's a great place for medical students and residents to publish neurology articles, and, um, and there's no charge. And I put art on the cover, so it's fun. So it's, um, the, uh, a couple more uh, nuggets of career advice. You know, you have to get your name out there. You have to go to meetings, and that's where people see you. Uh, do posters at me. Don't go to a meeting without a poster. Do posters at meetings, get the abstract published, and this is where you not only network with other people in your field, but you network with pharma. And this is how you get invited to be in, in uh, industry trials. And you just cannot work in isolation. Uh, you need to become affiliated in whatever disease area you're in with your community groups and with your patient groups, 
and, um, and always have multiple projects going, uh, at least three or four, not too many, but three or four projects going uh, so you don't wait for the big one. So I've networked a number of different ways. I started a website with my friends, um, which still goes on. I'm not very involved in it anymore. But all these neurologists from around the world, uh, they, they log in and they share cases and, and research ideas. Uh, and every, at whatever disease area you go into, you will find your people. And so you, I found my people over the years. And these are all the weird rare disease research groups uh, that I've been involved in. And it's really supported me during my career uh, as I've supported the research groups. Um, I am the head of something called the Neuromuscular Study Group. Uh, this is one of the ways I still stay in touch with academic uh, neurology in my field. And we have annual meetings. We had to go to Zoom for two years. That's the one in the middle. But then last year, we were back. Uh, in, uh, and we did this one in Italy with uh, neuromuscular research from, from around the world, young, uh, young folks just starting out. And we raise money from industry, and we send them to these meetings. Um, so that they can begin networking. So it's really important. So I heard this quote uh, listening to NPR in the morning 10 years ago, and they were interviewing Jimmy Connors. And he said, you know, maybe one thing is just good enough. Well, that's good enough for a tennis player, but not for us. Um, and if you're going to do medical research or just medicine in general, uh, uh, at, at least in the research game, you're really not hitting your groove till you're in your 40s. Uh, and you need to keep thinking of new ideas to stay in the discovery hunt. So this is the last video clip I'm going to have. And remember when I had my 10 essentials of research uh, success, I said that probably the most important was, was interest and desire. This may be a little excessive. Oh, all right, good. Uh, check the generator. Yes, master. Do you hear me? Give my creation life! Well, maybe a little too much, okay? But, <laughs> but that's the idea. Um, you really have to want to do it. So why? Why did Dr. Frankenstein, why was he so passionate about uh, doing research? Well, here is my list of motives. And they go from altruistic to not so much. Um, so you, uh, I th hopefully we get involved to improve health and humanity, to improve, uh, uh, to, uh, improve patient outcomes, um, to improve uh, health team performance outcomes. A lot of the great work that, you were, that we just heard from you, that definitely falls in this group. So congratulations. You're on the right track. <laughs> that was really good. Um, Publishing, you know, seeking new knowledge. Um, so uh, I didn't talk about, uh, I talked about publishing, I didn't really talk about patents, but we, we, uh, um, we did a dinner last night, and that's another route, you know, to, to patent your ideas and license them. Um, pursue what you enjoy and what you love to do. I think this is probably one of the most important things. You really have to like to do it, and hopefully like you, I... Uh, uh, I, I still go to work every day thinking that this is not a job. This is really a pleasure. Um, you, you do have to, though, make money. Um, so uh, whether or not you're uh, uh, doing only clinical work or you're doing a lot of research, um, you have to have an income. And so research does bring in grants. Uh, you can bring in uh, money through the business side of research if you license your ideas. Uh, and then there's sort of the... the the negative side, too, I mean, there are, everyone has some ego and nar narcissistic tendencies, but it can go too far, um, and, and, and that's what I have at the bottom. So I like this cartoon. Bixby, you're diligent, punctual, hardworking, and dependable. What's your angle? So, so here is just a list of what I've really talked, uh, the top part I've talked about, some of the traditional pathways to discovery. Uh, you can do it in the lab. I tried to do it in the lab. I wasn't very good at it, and I didn't like it. So I did it in the clinic. Um, uh, now you can do data mining um, through all sorts of large databases, including the electronic medical record. You can do quality improvement research. You can do research in simulation settings. And then you can do entrepreneurship, like I've alluded to, 
uh, and, and, uh, and, and get involved that way in discovery. But I think in the last 20 years, particularly, we've seen that some young people getting into the discovery world are less focused on the traditional ways of doing things, and they're more focused on uh, forming startups, raising venture capital to run a startup company, uh, licensing to a larger company, maybe getting an MBA, or maybe not even doing this at a university study, setting, uh, maybe doing it completely outside that, uh, uh, the, the typical uh, academy. And I heard Atul Butte, uh, who's a really distinguished uh, researcher in California, give a talk here about in town in 2016. And he's a teacher at UCSF. And he said the way he sees moving in the discovery world is that writing grants and papers is not as valuable for, for what he's doing and his students. That he thinks the key is in big data analysis that can lead to discovering biomarkers and outsourcing some of our research ideas to assaydepot.com. He gave an example of how he was able, just Googled up assaydepot.com and he gave him a strain of mice to do and a drug to do and he paid him money and they did the experiment for him and that, and that he used that as part of his uh, uh, company. Uh, uh, and so he said, don't write about it, just do it. And he said that 50% of his grad students at UCSF are doing startups and patents. So I, I don't think we're quite that extent uh, to that degree here, but we are gonna see a lot more of that. And that leads me to this cartoon that I uh, took from Doonesbury uh, a few years ago. And it's great, because this is graduation day. So this uh, college dropout uh, came to give the uh, commencement speak at graduation. And I guess his name is Mr. Sim. And so they said, Mr. Sim, the procession's about to start, and he goes, uh, I'm closing the deal, yo. And uh, they said, no worries, we'll hold it up for you. And so he gets up there in front of the graduates and he says, thanks guys, how crazy is this, right? Me, a Walden dropout, getting an honorary degree with my original class. And all I did was follow my dream of disrupting an inefficient industry. Okay, so, okay so far. By creating a surge pricing app for mobile sex workers, as you know, it changed the world. Meanwhile, after a four-year slog, here you all sit, minutes away from being credentialed, sheep waiting for sheepskins. It doesn't have to be this way, people. It's not too late to pivot. You can do it. So can, if, if I could do it, so can you. And the president or dean says, Chris, not loving where this is going, son. <laughs> Who's ready to drop out? And anyway, so that, that, that's going a little too far. All right. That is, those are my take wing comments. And I want to end by uh, thanking UMKC for launching me, uh, thanking the committee for giving me the take wing award. I have a big thanks to all of my mentors and mentees. Also, a number of my friends from the community came today. I want to thank all, all of you. And as, as I was thinking of this, I, I, I was thinking of that cold uh, winter day uh, when my dad drove me from St. Louis uh, to Kansas City. I think it was my first time I'd ever been to Kansas City. And I was thinking about my mom and dad who really gave me the opportunity to succeed growing up in St. Louis, and then from my dad driving me here uh, for the interview at the School of Medicine. So I am very, very grateful to everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Question, Dean Jackson? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'm wondering where you see AI as a component of yeah, well, as someone who doesn't know a lot about it, except I did try to download Ch Chet uh, GPT on my phone, and I played around with it, and like you, I've heard people uh, creating their lectures for presentations <laughs> just to show that it could be done, and it can be, um, so that's the dangerous side. Um, but I was in a, a, a research meeting a few weeks ago at MU where these really smart laboratory scientists were using chat DPT, a GPT as a tool to actually uh, uh, do, do legitimate research and that it was really taking their research to the next level. 
And it was just really eye-opening um, how they were able to harness uh, just the, the simple chat GPT tool. So it's pretty scary stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, I know the, a couple months ago, Elon Musk and others tried to put a moratorium on research in AI. I don't think that happened. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, I think there's the good and the bad side. But I, at least listening to some of my laboratory scientists that are at MU, I do, do, do think ChatGPT can be harnessed for good, and, and AI in general. Yeah, Dr. Dries, Dean Dries. Uh, quick question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, of yeah. advocacy for the importance yeah. of science, uh, because that's where some of our funding comes from, is through public funding. Uh, do you have thoughts about how researchers should explain the research to the public. And yeah, thanks for that question, Dean Dries. And for those who may not heard, is uh, uh, presenting research to the lay public and getting them involved. So this is a lesson that I've learned late in life. I'm sorry I didn't emphasize it much, but I did a little bit when I talked about PCORI. Because to get a Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute grant, in order to even put the application in, you have to show that you've convened focus groups of patients and that you've had that conversation and you are actually doing what they want to be seen in research. And we had to do that for my PCORI projects. And then, then after that, you have to come up with a plan for dissemination to the lay public, uh, and, they, and PCORI holds you to it. And um, I do think this is an area where traditionally medical researchers have failed. I know I have failed numerous times at the end of a randomized controlled study uh, in not notifying the participants in time uh, on, on the results of the study. And, uh, and so, uh, so one way around it is to get patients uh, and, and lay public involved very early in the study design. And when you're putting in NIH grants now, so NIH has sort of adopted some of the PCORI rules. And when you're putting in NIH grants now, they like to see that as well. So I think it really is important, but it's a hard lesson to learn uh, late in your career, we need to instill it in the young researchers. Yes, Carl. So, so Rick, I've done as a clinician in a private practice and then part-time here for all my career, I've done a number of gene therapy trials uh, for critical limb ischemia. And it was interesting because one of the mandates I had when I went to the IRC to get approval was that we had to offer crossover therapy at the end to the non, the placebo group. Yeah. So, I mean, that's even taken it farther than I think what you've talked about. And I think, actually, the people that were in the trials really liked that. Right. So they were a winner either way. Like so the, man, the doctor speaking is my good friend, Carl Stark. Carl and I were roommates together at UMKC when we just started <laughs> medical school. So thank you for coming, Carl. And he's been a vascular surgeon here in town for his whole career. And I didn't realize you were heavily involved in clinical trials, which, uh, uh, which is amazing. Uh, the point that you're making is valid, and it's nice if you can do uh, offer patients, all patients after they've been an RCT, that everyone can then get on the active drug. That is what you want to be able to tell your patients when they sign consent, and, and you were able to do that in your trial. Some small companies who have limited budgets can't offer that, and so you do need to tell the patients up front what the expectations are if they are going to be able to get open label after the randomized control trial part or not. Yeah, Raj, Bhutacharya. So first of all, I want to thank you for coming, but I really wanted to tell the audience about the great work that you did at KU. So I think you're very humble about that. So just for everyone to know, when Dr. Barron started the neurology program, program is a very, very small program, and it has grown exponentially. But the CTSA really put KU on the map in the sense that it was a flyover, without a doubt a flyover. And I don't know how many million the CTSA is, like... Uh, there are 25 to 30 yeah. million. Uh, it's a, yeah. The 25, it's a I mean, it makes a huge change. I, I just yeah. wanted to tell everybody that he created, it was a, when he left, it was like 40 or more neurology faculty. And I think he started with like four or something. <laughs> He's counting. Well, <laughs> uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, that's very nice of you. And that was the opportunity of a lifetime. 
uh, to be able to start a KU with a small neurology department and a really small research footprint and to be able to, with a lot of people like Laura Herbalin, who's in the room, um, grow that to something that's getting national attention. So I was very lucky and grateful to be put in that position. And just a little thing is uh, because of personal experience uh, for the young junior colleagues here is like definitely um, you can partner with industry, but I would not work for them. Speaking yes. of personal experience. Personal experience. <laughs> yeah, no, there definitely is danger there, yes. All right, any other questions? Once again, I am thrilled to be here in my medical school. Um, thank you, Dean Jackson, for everything and your friendship and for just making me so welcome for this Take Wing Award. And I am really looking forward to commencement this evening. Thank you.